Father, we are grateful for this opportunity once again to come into your presence to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would carry out his ministry of instruction and direction and guidance and that he may illuminate our minds and eyes and hearts so that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for the salvation of all those who would trust him for their salvation. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of today's message is simply Calvary. Calvary. And the passage that I want to look at, now we're going to uh, move within that chapter in Luke uh, several times, but I want to just start by reading in the gospel according to Luke and Verse 34, where it says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Calvary, what do we know about? Calvary. What do you know about Calvary? Well, Calvary is the most sacred place in the whole world. And there's a number of reasons why we would consider Calvary to be the most sacred place in the whole world. And before we get into the actual outline of this message, I want to consider some of those reasons why Calvary is such a place. Well, we know from the Gospels and from the Word of God that Calvary is where the Son of God died that the sons of man might live. That was the place where Jesus, the Son of God, surrendered His will to the Father and his flesh to man so that man might nail him to that tree in order that those who nailed him to that tree might live if they were to trust him for their salvation. Calvary is where the innocent blood of Jesus was shed to cleanse us all. You know that the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The Bible tells us that the only reason Christ came was in order to be able to offer himself as that sacrifice. And that there might be a sacrifice that might shed his life's blood for those that needed cleansing. And Calvary is that place. It's that place where innocent blood, the innocent blood of Jesus, was shed to cleanse us of our sin. Calvary is also the place where the sin of the world was laid upon him who knew no sin. I mean, I don't know if you've ever sat down to just fully consider that fact. Calvary is the place where the sin of the entire world, all of your sin, was laid on him who knew no sin. And him who knew no sin paid for your sin, so that when you come into a personal relationship with him, his righteousness might be attributed to you, imputed to you. Calvary is also that place where people come with their troubles and find peace that passes all 
understanding. Are you getting the image, the picture, as to why we claim that Calvary is the most sacred place in all the world? If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, then I understand you don't understand what I'm talking about. But you can if you would trust him for your salvation. If you're not a believer, there's not a place where you can go right now with your burdens and your troubles and lay them there and exchange them for the peace that passes all understanding. Because that, that is only something that God gives to those who know him personally. But that's what Calvary is to us. Calvary is the place where you and I receive life and joy and assurance. Calvary is also the place, bottom line, where Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. I sure praise God for Calvary. I will never understand the cost. I will never understand the sacrifice. I will never understand what Jesus experienced as the wrath of God was unleashed on him and as he paid the penalty for my sin. I will never know that and I praise God that I will never know the place I would have ended up in had he not provided Christ to die in my place. I know that to some of you, Calvary is a joke. And I know that to some of you, Jesus is nothing. But in spite of all of that, you know what Scripture says, one day all of humanity, when they see Jesus, will bow to him. Even those who will never, ever, ever see him or experience him or even be in a place where he is at all. Calvary is the most sacred place in the world. Now at Calvary there's three points I want to make about Calvary and we're going to move through Luke chapter 23 and look at a couple verses here. At Calvary, first of all, we see the love and compassion of Jesus. You remember the first few uh, words that I read? Then Jesus said, listen, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Listen, it was Jesus, the one who was treated brutally, the one who was bitten beaten and spat at and abused. It was the one that was rejected by those who himself had created. And it was while on that cross that Jesus turns to the Father and says, forgive them. At Calvary we see the love and compassion of Jesus. He was asking the Father to forgive those who crucified Him. Tell me that is not love and compassion. He was asking the Father to forgive those who had mocked Him. He was asking the Father to forgive those who had tempted Him. Jesus, while hanging on the cross, while experiencing the excruciating pain of crucifixion, while hanging on that cross, he was asking for the Father to forgive those who were indifferent to him. He was asking the Father to forgive those who denied him. And he was even asking the Father to forgive those as he was hanging on the cross, as he was pouring out his life's blood. Listen, as the Son of God was dying on that cross for nothing he had done, he was asking the Father to forgive even those who rejected him. And I'll tell you something, my friend, I sure thank God 
for the love and compassion of Jesus. You know why I'm a believer? You know why I am a child of God? Because Christ asked the Father to forgive me for I knew not what I did. Though I had denied him and though I had rejected him for many years, he still sought me and he still pursued me and he still wanted me to experience the blessings of his love and compassion. It is at Calvary that we see the love and compassion of Jesus. But also at Calvary we see the picture of salvation by grace alone. Now you remember the story that there were two thieves who were crucified side by side to Jesus. And the thief or the thieves had nothing to offer the Lord either before this hour or after this hour. But one of them came to him just as he was and Jesus saved him. What did that man do to earn his salvation? Nothing. There was nothing he could do. He was crucified right there along with Jesus. He couldn't perform good works. He didn't feed the hungry and clothe the naked and help the sick. He didn't go around proclaiming the kingdom. He was hanging, dying, right there at the side of Christ. And he came just as he was with nothing to offer the Lord. And nonetheless, we know that Christ saved that man. It's the same for you and me today, and it always has been that way. I have talked to so many people, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, who always come back with a very similar answer when I ask them what it is that they think is required for somebody to go to heaven. Good works is undoubtedly the most popular answer you get from probably 80 to 90 percent of the people you talk to. Most people believe that somehow they contribute to their salvation, that somehow they help Christ in accomplishing their salvation. They work for their salvation. The fact that that man crucified right next to Jesus was saved without having performed any good works or having submitted to any ceremony or having not adopted any particular creed was saved is testimony to the fact that a person is saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Let me ask you, for those of you who are working towards salvation, aren't you exhausted? I mean, if you were somehow going to contribute to your own salvation, don't you think that by now you would have some peace in your soul because you achieved what you were hoping to achieve? I know what your heart and I know what your soul and I know what your mind are both all three telling you and they're telling you that if you're going to earn your salvation by works, you're going to have to do a lot better than what you've done up to now. And the bottom line is even that is a lie from the pit of hell. A man is saved by trusting Christ and Christ alone. You know what this thief did in order to be saved? He repented as he recognized his sinfulness. He acknowledged himself to be a sinner. And secondly, he trusted Jesus because he saw and believed that he was who he had claimed to be, the very Son of God. And he realized he was allowed to see by faith that Christ was hanging there precisely to save his soul, even at that very moment. 
And that's all you have to do to be saved. You know that I've had people tell me, or people who will not ask Jesus to come into their hearts because they think that what we're asking them to do in order to be saved is way too simple. We hope everything in life, we wish everything in life were much simpler than the way it is. Yet when we offer the simplicity of the gospel, they reject it because it's too simple. Simply repent and trust Him. So Calvary, we see the love and compassion of Jesus. At Calvary, we see the perfect picture of salvation by grace alone. And at Calvary, also, we hear the promise to all who come. You remember what Jesus told the thief who repented and trusted Him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Instantaneous. You know what the Bible says? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus promises you that the moment you die physically, you will be with Him in paradise. And let me tell you something. It is hard to understand what that even means because there's nothing we can compare that paradise with. Our paradise pales by comparison to what that paradise is like. And I'm not even sure we're going to be concerned with the makeup of that paradise. I think we're just going to be completely and utterly blown away by the absolute awesomeness and majesty and glory of Christ. Eternity has to be eternity because any less time than eternity, we would never be able to even begin to absorb the immensity, the beauty, the awesomeness, the glory of God. He promises us that the moment we die, we are with Him in paradise. But more importantly, for those of us who will not die for some time because He's got work for us to do, and that would be the only reason why you're even here, to bring Him glory and to do good works for the kingdom. But for those of us who will remain here for some time, guess what? We now have the privilege of experiencing Him. Our eternal life in the presence of God began the day we gave our hearts to Jesus. All men have eternal life. The question is whether it's in the presence of God or absent from anything God. Life for the believer began the moment he trusted Jesus, like this thief did. And the bonus is that when I leave this earth, then I will be with Him face to face. In a real place, the Bible calls heaven. And finally, I want to show you that at Calvary, it is the place where we hear the words, listen, it is finished. Salvation. can be experienced by any who is willing to acknowledge his sinfulness and acknowledge Christ for who he is and acknowledge what he did on their behalves. Salvation is within the reach of all people. There's no secret passwords. There's no secret codes. There's no more privileged people and less privileged people when it comes to the gospel. God desires for all to be saved, for all to come to the saving knowledge of the truth. When Christ died, He died for all. 
Salvation is made available to all who will come to Him, repenting of their sin and acknowledging Him as their Lord and Savior. And the only p reason why somebody would ever end up in hell, and by the way, hell is not a place God created for people. Do you know that? The Bible tells us that hell was created for the devil and his angels. God never intended for man to go to hell. The only reason why people go to hell is because they chose to reject Christ and thus condemned themselves to hell. God has made provision for all to be saved and salvation is within the reach of all people. But we must recognize and confess who we are and recognize and confess who Christ is and what it is that He has done. And by faith, stretch out our hands and accept the gift of eternal life. When Christ said, it is finished, salvation was completed. There is no other sacrifice that needs to be done, uh, made. There is no good work that you must do to contribute to the completed work. When He said, it is finished, He meant, it is finished. If Christ said, it is finished, why is it that we are so adamant about doing something to contribute to that which is already completed. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible also says that for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. And Jesus Himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus Himself said that no one comes to the Father but by Him. The only thing that you must do in order to be saved is accept the gift that He's offering you by simply acknowledging your sin, repenting of that sin, and trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Calvary is the most most sacred place in the world because it's the only place that you can go to spiritually and leave your old self there and walk away a new creation. One of my favorite hymns is entitled, Jesus Paid It All. And the hymn says, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Will you come to Calvary today and leave your old self there and allow Christ to make of you a new creation so that you might be with Him one day in paradise. And will you, believer, thank Jesus, thank God for Calvary. Father, we are so grateful for Calvary. Indeed, it is the most sacred place in all the world. We thank You for Him who died there. We thank You for Him who made it the most sacred place in the world. Indeed, we owe it all to Jesus, for Jesus paid it all. We give you all the glory and honor in His name. Amen. For all of us here at Truth to Live By, we just want to let you know that it's an absolute privilege for us to be able to meet with you every single week. We want to let you know that we want to uh, make sure you join us once again each and every week at this time and on this station uh, so we can together study the Word of God. Uh, Truth to Live By is a ministry of Reasons for Faith International Ministries. This is a ministry committed to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the defense of the historical orthodox doctrines of the Christian faith. If you are a Christian, it is our sincere prayer that God is using these programs, these messages, to speak to you, to build you up, to equip you for service so that you may be able to effectively work for Him 
uh, in the work of the kingdom in this lost and dying world. If you're not in a personal relationship with Christ, then you sense the Holy Spirit prompting you to make that decision even right now. You can do that simply by repeating this simple prayer after me. Father, I recognize that I am a sinner, and as such, I am spiritually dead. I confess and repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. I also understand that there is no other name under heaven given to us by which we must be saved other than Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, I trust you right now as my Lord and Savior. I pray that you would make of me a new creation. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. For it is in his name I pray. Amen. I can tell you on the authority of the Word of God that if you have just prayed that simple prayer sincerely from your heart, your sins have been forgiven and you are now a member of the family of God as an adopted son or adopted daughter. If you have prayed that prayer, will you please contact us and let us know of this decision you have just made? If uh, you're a Christian, we want to know how God is using this program to minister to you. Will you drop us a note or give us a call as well? It is our honest prayer that God will continue to minister to all of you, use these programs to bring glory to himself, to build the saints, equip them for service, and to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. We pray for your prayers, and we pray that you would also pray for the viewers. Share us with your family and friends so that they may become part of the Truth to Live By viewing family. God bless you, and Lord willing, we will see you once again right here on this same station at this same time next week.